I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello everyone, welcome to Bigfoot, America's Creek Devil. We have sort of a double header today. We have Mike and Chad with us. Uh, Mike, you're in Maryland, is that correct? Yep, okay. northeast area. Okay, let's start with you. Um, uh, you just, I'll hand you the mic, and, and we have kind of a full panel here that can ask questions. But uh, take it away. Tell us what you've experienced. Okay, so we'll kick things off. Uh, I think this will be my third time on the show. And uh, I always told Will that, uh, you know, I'll give you all the evidence as I get it. And uh, finally, I had my encounter, and it turned out to be a double encounter, daylight. 30 feet away from me. So it's exciting to call and let you know about what happened. But uh, so it, this all started back in 2017. Uh, I I have a brother and he worked at a dealership and his father has a, uh, his son. So his boss's son worked as a government agent. I guess you could call it a forest. Uh, what do you what do you say? Uh, DNR, Department of Natural Resources, all these footprints are turning up in his area, and he doesn't know who to turn to, so he knows I'm into this kind of stuff, and then he reached out. So ever since then, I've been taking calls from him that, you know, people in the area turn into him, I go check it out. So from about November 2017, I've been going out on my own, me and three other people I entrusted, and it's just us three, and we we figure out what's going on, we get permission, and you know, camp out and all that stuff. And we've had a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. I've got hair samples, too many casts to keep casting. I've got basically a truckload ready to unload at some kind of convention or whatever, but I got a, I got a stock load. But anyway, we've had some maybe sightings, some maybe encounters, like some screams, uh, trees pushed over on two occasions. I had an experience when I first went out there at night where I froze solid, couldn't blink, couldn't move, couldn't breathe, and I don't know how long I was stuck in that position, and then snapped out of it after hearing a couple knocks or woodpecker-type sounds. So all these things collectively, I'm just sort of following what I get, like, you know, finding prints on my own, checking my areas on a regular basis, writing notes, keeping a notebook, and I come in today because I think it was about a year ago, uh, springtime, and I was just doing my regular route. I had gotten off work early, so I arrived at the location to do my routes, and I hear a couple gunshots going off in the area because they have a range nearby. So that's normal sound for me. <clears throat> and then I hear some 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 yells, some some deep projected. I can't understand what it is. I'm 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 assuming to myself, like, this thing has got my attention. What is that? And I don't know what it is. I can't even describe it. It's sort of just like somebody yelling at his kids or his dog or something like that. So I just sort of stand there and I'm listening. And I'm standing in a spot where I've got numerous casts. So this is sort of the, the, the walkway for these things where we always just check and see. I mean, nine out of ten times, you would think that, you know, that's where they'd be cutting through. So I'm standing there listening. The sound gets closer. And I'm like, man, what is that? It's closer. I still can't understand. And it sort of sounds like just one thing yelling at something else. And it's the same tone, same voice, same projection. And then nothing. So I'm just standing there. I don't hear any sticks breaking or I don't hear anything. I'm just standing there listening. And all of a sudden, out of my left peripheral, that's so I'm standing on a cross trail, like a three way. Behind me, there's a way. On the right, there's a way. On my left, there's a way. And that, that's my left side is where I see this creature break the tree line. And we're talking about maybe eight feet wide of a trail that I could see clearly. 
And so I turn to the left as I'm turning my head left to see what this thing is crossing. I see like a black and grayish speckled creature on all fours. And he's already almost to the other side within milliseconds from, you know, that's an eight foot gap within milliseconds as I'm turning my head to look. And as I see the head of the next creature is behind the right hip of the first creature. And they look identical in size, identical in the way they're on all fours, skip, you know, going across. But I can't see, I didn't see any ears. I didn't see any tails. They weren't loping up and down like deer or dogs or fox or anything there. And they were big. I didn't know at that time how big because it was just such a brief second. But the back one looked champagne, like almost an orange. So we're talking about a black and gray creature with, the, you know, almost a bright champagne orange creature. So I'm like, that's not deer. What, what, what kind of two creatures are mixing right here? with all these circumstances in this little scenario. So anyway, by the time I actually got a good glimpse of the back one and, the, and half of the front one, they were already broke. They, they break and broke the other tree line and they stop. They just, I hear them just halt and they're out of my sight. I don't hear anything. I don't see anything. They're just, everybody froze. And then I sort of looked that direction still and thinking to myself, let me startle them, see what they do, see if they move. So I stomp towards them and I go, Wah! like give them a, give them a startle. And then boom, crack, smash, boom. Cause like, oh, I mean, it was intimidating. They were making so much noise getting away from me, I guess, trying to intimidate me, whatever these two things were, that they didn't want me to follow them or investigate. But then all that noise, that kicked in in my mind. I'm like, Oh my God, this could be it. So I, did an immediate U-turn, ran for the car, because where I parked is where they were headed, because there's a street that they would have to cross if they were going in that direction. So I figured I can head them off on parking right next to that street, only two football fields up. So I ran as fast as I could back to my car to cut them off. But by the time I got there, I didn't hear or see anything else. But that's, that's pretty much the encounter. Any questions, everybody? Anyone? <clears throat> What color did you say they were? So the first one was like a like a black and gray speckled, or I guess I could say speckled, but I in my mind I saw black with gray mix. But the back one was a lot more solid, like a champagne or an orange. And I did do a size comparison because that day I thought about, well, I'm not sure what that was. It was fast. I mean, fast, fast, the incident. But I got a good look at the back one. Anyway, so one of my partners who lives in the Baltimore area, he came down. He's about 6'2", 6'3". And uh, <clears throat> he got on all fours just like those creatures were right where, you know, the incident had happened. And my heart dropped out of my chest. It just dropped. I got chills. I was scared. I mean, that was a just seeing how big these things actually were. But in the moment, I thought maybe, oh, you know, just a couple big dogs. Like it didn't really spark till I put all my details together. So these things were probably, if you can, if you can, if you can picture, like, you know, how, you know, how people have like propane tanks horizontally set up in their, on their properties, people that have propane, they're about, I don't know, four feet, four and a half feet tall. Imagine the back identical height about that high. So they were pretty, they were big on all fours. I mean, that's like almost horse. Yeah, I have a propane tank, so I know exactly how tall that is. Yeah. Yeah. And well, I mean, the, if, the if, nobody, if, if nobody else is saying it, I'll say it. You're damn lucky it didn't decide to come after you and turn you into a damn pretzel. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, it, well, lucky for me, my uh, moron instinct to chase these things was after the fact. So I'm kind of glad it went down that way because if if it would if it were to you know clicked in my mind as I'm turning my head and, and saw these things, but they were moving so freakish. I mean, it was freaky how fast these things moved and how quiet. I didn't even hear them come up, and they're 30 feet away from me. Didn't hear a thing. I heard them yelling or something yelling. There was no cars in the parking lot. 
there was nobody on the trail. It was just me in the woods and the shooting range, maybe quarter mile up. And you can't hear people up there. It's just shots, just, just shots in the, you know, in the distance. Did they stay on all fours the whole time? Yes. Yep. They broke both sides of the tree line on all fours. Alrighty. Well, we can go into more questions in a bit. Chad, Chad, first of all, do you want to give people your contact information if they've had encounters there where you are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are on Facebook, JRG Michigan Bigfoot. Um, my my right hand, Sherry Barcia, runs runs it and takes care of all the emails and, and things like that. Um, our email is um, SB michigan bigfoot at gmail.com and you can send any emails there or messenger we have the report forms we can help you fill them out and uh it definitely if somebody gives us a report we we follow up on it we've already gotten um a few from you from you in the month well from jrg um research group and uh we followed up on all of them and there will be reports coming out that that you guys that we'll all be able to receive. We'll all have. All right. So uh, my cousin David had to run away for just a minute to do something. He'll be right back. But I'm he, back. Huh? Oh, you're here. Okay. Well, he had he had an encounter in Michigan also. But so tell us what's going on there. Mich- Michigan is is one of the top states. And it's one of the most viable states with the habitat and resources necessary for a population of these creatures to survive. So there is a lot happening here, but Michigan has a lot of vast wilderness that just doesn't get touched. A lot of farmland that's private property that the only time people are there is for, for the crops or or when they get to go on for hunting. Uh, it's a great state. It really is. Um, I don't think people really understand how diverse the environment is here. So everything that is needed for this species to survive, Michigan has the ample resources for a, 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 a large hominid species to be able to survive in family groups here. Well, tell us about some of the encounters that you've collected so far from people. Well, from people, actually, I mean, I've I've had encounters out with people, but what's been collected isn't even out there yet. Sherry's working on that with, with, with all the forms and stuff. So what we've collected so far, um, I, I went out with, with a member of your group. I'm not going to say names. Uh, and... And I took him out to some areas and I explained to him the things that I look for because he's kind of new to this, but he's had weird things that's happened that when he's been in the woods and he's had secondhand, like his sister that tells her in an area north of us that she's having all this stuff happen. So a lot of the stuff you get is stuff like that where people don't really understand what's going on and, and a good reason for them to contact us is for us to put an investigative team out there and to look for the signatures of what we believe they leave. Um, you know, people call them structures. I think they're more like signs, signatures, markings, like street signs and things and things like that. That's, that's my belief. I can't prove that. I don't know. Nobody knows, but we look for things like that. And we also look for viable like type habitats. There's three things they need. They need a good, clean water source. They need thick, heavy cover with uh, the ability to escape, and they need food source. That's all that you need to have a viable um, Bigfoot Sasquatch habitat. So we'll, we'll go out, we'll look at the area, we'll see if it's like viable, or there's another thing. Maybe they just migrate through at a certain time of the year and move through to move to another area, even though the area isn't a feasible living area for them. I prefer to research in areas that that I bleed if I go into and come out of that people just don't walk into and you get into the middle of this the thickest of the thick stuff and 
you find good at and that's a great places to find hair too because their hair gets snagged on branches and stuff as they move through there you find the corridors the trails um like huts built with vines that are manipulated off of trees forced to grow this way for years and years and years and now it's like basically like a an igloo without the ice so we look for those types of things when we go look in viable research areas and i the encounters we have are always in areas like that swamps thick impenetrable impenetrable stuff areas to escape areas to where if a human came on one and it could just run 50 yards and there's nothing you can do because you're not going to that swamp you're not going to that thicket and if you are you're not going through as fast as they can sorry if i got off topic hey chad Ed, this is David, uh, Will's cousin. Got a question for you. Yeah. Yeah. When I lived in the Gawney, um, I lived out off of uh, 442 County Road, and we had one that would come around our property a lot. And at night, he would come and slap on the backside of the house, jump up on the roof, run across it. Did you ever have any experiences like that in your areas? Kind of, and to some extent, yes to that extreme, and to some extent, no. Sometimes it can be lesser. Now, here again, there is no professional in this research thing because they're not even proven to be real yet. So, how can you be a professional? But what 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 I've and many have concluded is they are constant observers. If they're living in areas with populations. They have to be aware of everything. It only makes sense. How can they stay hidden? So they're constantly observing everything we do from a distance. They'll even mimic it. And they're also curious. They have no real entertainment. Uh, and it's typically, I believe, the young ones that do this stuff at night. Uh, sometimes it could be adults. Uh, but I don't know. I can't say that's what it is. But they're curious. And, and they're like juveniles that'll play tricks they'll come steal something from you they'll be gone for two weeks and they can return it i've i've heard that multiple times Alrighty, mike everything oh go ahead i'm sorry everything i'm going to say everything i'm going to say i cannot prove other than when i talk about something i actually saw okay this is just from years of being in the field using common sense, studying other researchers' knowledge that have been doing this longer than me to draw a, hypo a hypothesis, a conclusion, a logical conclusion, because I, I believe getting too scientific in this, if you can turn this too scientifically, okay, there's enough reports to say there's something out there. I am not a believer in the fact that these things can just cloak and disappear or change dimensions and are still there, but they're just in a dimension you can see or portal. Can I prove that they don't do that? No. And in fact, if they could do that, that would give a whole huge explanation to all of this. But in when, in my research and in my findings, no, they run, they run or they'll chase, they'll disappear, but they do it be, through nature through natural camouflage, through their, their achromatic coloring, and hair samples already prove that they have. You can't prove they're their they're hair samples. They're possibly human. Let me break in on that they're, and confirm that, because the hair sample that I have, it's, it's jet black in the inside light. And mm -hmm. then you take it outside, and it's translucent. How do you explain hair like that? It's uh, adaptation. That's wild. It's, uh, it's just like any other animal in the world, like a chameleon changing colors or a bird blending in or anything like that. They've adapted to this. It, it's uh, There's another word I'm looking for, but I can't come up. It's uh, evolution. Okay, there's a word I was looking for. Uh, Mark Zasky, my mentor, uh, a friend of mine that I've been out with many times, uh, we procured a lot of hair in an area, and they were all 9 to 11 inches long. In the thickness of them, you could only compare to a horse's mane or tail. 
<laughs> the only uh, the only other thing it could be. No other animal has this hair. And when introduced at magnified a hundred times out of an outside light source, it reflected purple, greens, blues, yellows, every like all the spectrums of the colors. And all you have to do is change the angle of the uh, the outside light source that you were reflecting on this hair only magnified a hundred times. I, it should be looked up. Th- this man is incredible. Uh, he gets <coughs> not enough credit for all the work he's done in the clear. You see, he doesn't take pictures of with a cell phone. He videos areas and then goes frame by frame by frame. And then he takes what he finds and then he watches for movements and things. He's got some of the most incredible and incredible things you'd ever see. He's, he's the reason that I go out in the field. It, it went above my interest in studying this in, in 2012, maybe, 2011. He convinced me. Put your, put hey, your Chad, boots do you have on the ground. Any interesting, do you have any interesting stories from field work or anything that's happened in your area? Oh. We didn't even get to stories yet, but like what I already told Will that there's no way I can tell all of my quote unquote possible encounters that don't seem like anything normal to all of my sightings in one show. Uh, Do you want me to, you know, start, I'll start from the beginning when I wasn't even into Bigfoot and it bothered me for years and years and years and years because it was so traumatic to me and I didn't understand what happened to me. And this is back in my early 20s. This would be in the early 2000s. Uh, we drove hours and hours and hours from southern Michigan to the Upper Peninsula, Marquette County, to go deer hunting. Um, my two buddies, well, one was my buddy and one was his best friend from high school. They, wanted to go, they went one way. I went another way. I found this swamp. And I'm walking around the swamp, and all of a sudden, and I'm like, I don't know, this is a long time ago, but I'm a long ways away from where we parked our car, where I find this. And then all of a sudden, I find this opening, and this is just a huge opening. I peek my head in it, and I don't see any other openings from in it, but it's a very large swamp, maybe four or five acres, maybe bigger. And I'm like, well, great place to sit. I'll sit behind this tree. It's one way in, one way out, and I'll wait for my deer. And I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting there for hours and hours. And I hear all of a sudden this, like, popping sound just once, like a like a tongue click, but louder, like a pop. And my, I'm experienced outdoorsman and hunter. My attention is right to the sound, and I'm just locked on it. And I'm just locked staring, thinking, okay, what is this? And... Then I start hearing footsteps, and I know quadrupedal to bipedal steps. Okay, it, this is this is in the end of November in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. There's leaves all over. A deer is going to drag their feet, and you're going to hear this this swoosh sound as they walk. I've hunted so long; they make this sound in these leaves. But I'm just hearing crunch, crunch slowly. So now my attention is over here, and this is kind of off to my right and behind me. So I'm locked on this, and I'm locked on this, and my heart is racing. And my heart's racing, and, like, big time. I've never been that excited before in my life. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's a deer, but I know the sound. It does not sound like a deer walking through the woods. Then I get a, the tongue click or whatever, the pop again, right in the same spot, and then stick it on the edge of the swamp. And now I'm back on that. I'm thinking, deer maybe? Is there deer? Is there... What else am I thinking? I'm not even really into Bigfoot. I mean, I knew of it I'm from old TV shows and stuff. And I'm locked onto it. And then I hear the footsteps again. And they're get, and they're like closer. And there's all kinds of trees and stuff around. I'm hiding behind a tree at the entrance of the swamp, just kind of sitting off the side in case something went in or out. All of a sudden, I started just feeling scared. I felt like something just is not right. There's something wrong. I got it. My whole body started feeling weird after it stopped when I heard it again. Then the, the next tongue click. I 
I have a 12 gauge shotgun loaded slug, buckshot, buckshot, slug. Why am I so scared and running out of the woods? And I can't explain the overwhelming feeling that came through through me. It was just something I think people need to understand because in most of my encounters, this before they happen or why they're happening, you get this feeling. You get this feeling in your body that something's not wrong. Sometimes you feel like there's something wrong with your body. Sometimes you just get overwhelmed with fear. And I just ran out of there. I ran out of there. I got back to the, the, the truck and I sat there and waited for my friend and his best friend. And they came out and I'm like, and they're like, what are you talking about? No, no. And I watched where they came out of. They came out of the way they went. And I went the opposite direction and I just could never explain it for years and years and years that bothered me. And then when more the internet had more access to information, this is would be back in like the early mid two thousands when, I mean, you could pretty much find anything around that time. And then monster quest came out and I thought, what did that come out? 2006, 2007 when my, and then, you know, I'm hearing some of these stories and, and a lot of Monster Quest was based on Bigfoot type things. And so now I'm hooked. Now I'm searching everything I can find on the internet and all my spare time I'm searching. I don't, was he Google even around then? I don't, maybe it was. And I'm searching and searching and searching and for years and years and years. And then 2011 what was it uh, 2010 uh, finding bigfoot came out which i was so excited about because i i had i had not been out in the field looking for these creatures when this happened to me i wasn't looking for them i was looking for deer i had not gone out and research finding bigfoot came out and i was so pumped because i'd already watched every monster quest episode everything i could find and i'm into it and i'm loving it and then i realized after a few episodes, this is just nothing but a farce. This is, they're, if they find them, they're never going to tell you. I continue to watch it for the eyewitness encounters. The only thing I liked about Finding Bigfoot after the first three episodes was, so I'd watch it every week when the new episode come out just for that and to see what they did. The clowny thing they did. In my opinion, you don't go out in the woods to try to create an interact interaction if you're in an area that you can see that they're in because they already know you're in the area. So why would you go out there and bang on a tree and hoot and holler? No, you go out there and you act oblivious. If you're in an area that you find signatures, even if they're not, if you find things that you think are signatures, you go out there and you act oblivious. You do search for their stuff. You do look for signs. But you just act like you're out there not doing nothing. You don't act, you don't go out there and try to mimic them because all you're doing is giving up. You're giving up to them. If they're there and they're watching you and you start knocking on a tree and you start trying to mimic their whoops, they're, they're smart enough to realize why you're there. You, you know, there's some things I will do. Okay. I will mimic owls and, on a lot of my encounters and occasions, owl hoots are involved. I, hey, could it be an owl? Absolutely. But if owls start hooting, I hoot. Why would they use owl calls? Well, it's the most one of the most normal calls at night for communication, for location to say, if I'm walking through the woods and somebody goes, hoo, 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 right by me, then another one further away can hoo hoo back that they got the message and they, they, they know exactly where I am as, as I'm trekking through the woods. Now, again, can I prove this? Absolutely not. But in my experience, this is the conclusion I've came to. Sorry if I talked too long. Good stuff. Where, where are you located at in Michigan? I'm in southeast Michigan, but I travel the whole state. I like, I'll give my kind of locations. Uh, I like to research in the Waterloo Recreation Area, which is in south 
Central Michigan, which is the largest state game area in Michigan. I think it's 20 or 40,000. I think it's 20,000 acres. It might be 40. But the largest actual area, there's other state game areas that are attached to it. And then I also like the Manistee National Forest area, especially in Nuego County, in that area, where, believe it or not, on the BFRO sightings reports, I think it's the only county with no reports, which I find very suspicious. You might want to try some of the Manistee National Forest area. That's where it is. It's Manistee. But you're down in the southern part. I'm talking up towards Cadillac. Yeah. Well, Nuego County is the Manistee National Forest. We go to, like, the Deadstream Swamp uh, up in Rathcommon County. We go all the way to the UP. Uh, you know, we just set up outings and stuff. And if somebody wants to get involved enough with us and kind of can gain our trust through messaging with us and meeting us on small excursions, they would be more than welcome to come out to a camp out or documentaries that that uh we're we're part of uh, we have a documentarian that's i think he's got eight eight out eight i think eight's coming out or maybe nine and uh in the last two years uh he's come out with us on on three occasions and we we don't just do it i make no money at this Okay, get this. I spend money to do what I do. I spend money to get the documentarian here. I, I do this for my belief and, and love of this topic and subject, and there are great people in it. There's, don't get me wrong. There's also clown shoes in this. There are trolls, clown shoes, uh, people that think they know it all, that don't even go out in the field, but they're keyboard warriors. And I do my best. I do my best to ignore them. Uh, you know, even me, sometimes, sometimes they can get to me. They can just hit a nerve and it, you got to say something to them, which isn't the best thing to do. Best thing's just to ignore them because then you win. Well, can I ask you a question? Uh, did I Absolutely. understand you? Uh, I had to step away just for a minute. Uh, but uh, uh, did I understand you to say that uh, you, you claim that Bigfoot has translucent hair? It's achromatic. It's a color distortion that's known in science. So translucent, I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's possible, but because of their their hair with no medulla, because of their skin tone, they can reflect and refract the colors around them. So, like, you can see a picture. Somebody has a Bigfoot, and they look green. Why is it green? It's not green. It's in the achromatic color spectrum spectrum that runs from white to gray to black. What it's doing, it is absorbing and reflecting the colors surrounding it. That's part of their camouflage. Like a chameleon actually changes colors. I don't believe a Bigfoot actually changes colors. I believe that the light source around it and and the forestry and the colors around it cause the reflection refraction there's been studies on this it's called achromatic color distortion and it, it can be looked up and mark zasky did a really good job with it sorry to mention his name again but well uh, you are aware that there are no primates that uh, have that possess this which i, I specifically Do, heard are you also aware that there? there's there's no primates that that have a nine to 14 inch long hair not even orangutans maybe maybe an orangutan can get that long and did you also know that there's no primates that have bipedal locomotion so i prefer not to call them a primate even though we come from primates i it, there, there's something in between there. Hey, Chad. I believe. Did you know? You know, Forrest yeah. is a qualified anthropologist. <laughs> yeah, she's a well. Primate. She's a scientist. <laughs> what What primate has the longest hair? Orangutans. Uh, yeah. Chimpan. Some chimpanzees have long locks too. How long, though? 
You know what? I never got out and measured their locks, but uh, orangutans with the general rule have the longest hair. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, but you, uh, I hey. heard you say that, I heard you say that uh, that you had found uh, hair as long as a horse's tail. That uh, that yeah, supposed nine to four. No, the thickness, the thickness was like a mane or a tail. The lengths were all nine to fourteen inches, and we found a lot of them. And I sent them off to a study for a lawsuit in California. I'm not going to say names, and they stole them and never gave anything back. And they even had uh, follicles on the end. They even had some of them had the follicles on the end, and I never heard they were supposedly sent to Mexico. And yeah, so and that's a true story. There's people that can vouch where we found the hair, and they they shame me for sending it all in. I just didn't think about it that many years ago. Why didn't I save some of it? I have photos yeah. of them. I've posted. Too bad, it. too bad you didn't save it because with the follicle you could have had a DNA uh, test run. Well, next time I go to Florida, I do know where to get them. Um, <laughs> well, one thing I can say, they they have to survive on the forest, right? They're not just carnivores. They're omnivores, obviously. There's no way that they're not. And a lot of the protein they get are from things like nuts in the woods. And all these young white oak trees that were bearing the the nuts, we were finding that they were picked. And the hairs were caught like seven to eleven foot up in the trees, and they were all long hairs. So, you know, I don't think enough people look up. I really don't. Like they're looking on the ground for a print. But if you're in an area that has low hanging acorns, look up and look at those branches, because that's where we found all this hair. Hmm. Well, I've long said that I, I think they spend a lot more time uh, being arboreal than they do, uh, than we think that they do. But uh, uh, they're certainly built to be arboreal as well as bipedal. So um, anyway, but we do have a history. We have a long-term history of apes that are bipedal in the fossil record. Yes, sir. I agree. All hominids. No, sir, not hominids. They were they were actual uh, early early fossils uh, in, uh, from Europe and some from uh, that have just been uh, discovered down in Africa. But these were actually uh, not uh, hominids. They are not in the hom- hominid line. They are actually apes and monkeys. That's that's incredible. I didn't hear about it yet, but I'm glad to hear about it. I'll, I'd love to look into it. I really would. Uh, I'm, I'm highly interested in that. Yeah. Look up for you. It's a European. Uh, yeah, go ahead. No, no you, can, you can go ahead and finish up there. No, it's okay. That's okay. You're Sorry. fine. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to sneak in a story I don't think I told Will last time we were on the phone because it had happened maybe between, but I'm not sure. But you guys might find this interesting, especially our police officer on board. So we've had eye sightings in this area uh, from 35 years ago all the way up till today, like confirmed visual sightings with prints. And one of them was really interesting. A retired judge jogs back there and he brought a sighting to my insider and he brought that to me. And then not long after that, one of the workers, one of the maintenance, or I guess you'd call it forest rangers, not necessarily a DNR officer, but a, uh, I guess you could just call it a city worker who, who, who does rounds through the park. He's an older gentleman, almost ready to retire, so he didn't want to speak up publicly about it, but he brought it up to my DNR friend, and us three know about it. So he he does rounds. I mean, he, you know, runs the property at night with his truck, and all that and he came around a corner and he saw this eight foot upright hairy looking creature just getting ready to step out into the road and cross to his right from left to right and it turned and looked at him and by the time he blinked his eyes and looked back up it did a complete 180 
where it was standing and shot back into the forest and was gone like a flash, like a blur. And it, and it shook him so much. And I went, okay, well, let's, I'd like to, uh, check this out, you know, follow up, see if I could see anything. And, uh, was escorted to the area where the eye sighting or where the guy saw it. And I'll be damned. I, I found 19 and a half inch footprints right by the road. As he said, left foot back, right foot forward, just as he described. And then they spin to the left, like, like a half a circle and they shoot back into the woods. And as I follow my eyes, you can see the, the smash down leaves, at least seven, eight feet. It's getting further apart each step. And then you see busted branches headed straight through the forest. So, I mean, that, I mean, how, how much more perfect can you get on that? You know, my suggestion to Mike is he probably needs to look at, uh, go research Oliver. He was a chimpanzee yeah. from the seventies and he yeah. did not go to all fours. He walked upright. Even to the yeah. day. He died. Yeah. This one, yeah, this one was standing besides the road. And there's three more encounters locally all attached to the same area, eyewitnesses that I followed up on, and I found evidence. And I believe there's a dump connected to this area, and the dump has had issues. They're like, man, something something with lunchbox hands about six feet apart are ripping up our chain link fence. No tire tracks, no nothing, but just big impressions left in this path. And we fixed this damn fence probably four years in a row. And around the same time every year, this fence gets ripped right back up. You know, And that's the exact, that's the exact line where I saw my sighting and casted all these prints. You know, the trash will attract them for sure. And then we were talking uh, on Campfire Talk about that, about, um, you know, Chuck, you were talking about the pipe that was indented and uh, we had a guy, our guy Jason in Arizona, that had a chain link fence. It was uh, the one of the posts was bolted into the concrete, and it was ripped out of that by the creatures. Uprooted. Yeah, it was basically uprooted. I think. Did I send Impressive. you pictures of that, TW? Yeah, you did. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean that wasn't that wasn't any but, raccoon you know, or anything, but. <laughs> we were laughing. No, at... if that was a raccoon, I don't want to run into it. <laughs> we were laughing about that on another show. So, but yeah, that's. I mean, if 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 you've been at some serious research long enough, you got to do your due diligence on reading other reports, and you kind of fish through it, find out what what's what, and what you think is probably out there in the left field, and what what actually makes sense and and there's there's a lot of reports where they they have encounters in quarries or or dumping grounds or even in dump uh, yeah. uh as a matter of fact i read one uh and you know it, i'm probably one of the few that would admit to uh going to uh bfro reading their reports and one guy was, this is out of Michigan, that he actually caught one robbing his uh, his uh, smokehouse. Oh, yeah. And the thing never even knew he was behind him until he, you know, he come out and looked, and there's there's a dude standing right there, and he had two hands in his hands. And, that, of course, that would have me off, too. I think I'd have been upset, so, you know, somebody stealing my hands. But... Uh, uh, you know, it's not unusual uh, to to hear about a, uh, encounters in in dump areas. I mean, I even took you to that one area there in New Mexico. That uh, that's a known dump area, and lo and behold, those teenage kids got got the holy hell scared out of them. Oh yeah, uh, it was far enough away that they said that it wasn't. Uh, you know, they didn't. Uh, they were scared. They didn't feel like they were being threatened, but they were scared because that thing was just glaring at it, giving the stink guy. It's primal. The fear you feel is just so primal. My my area that I've had two daylight encounters at, right across the street, it's a metro park, is the biggest dump in the state of Michigan, the biggest landfill in the state of Michigan, right across the street. Not only that, there is a massive power line trail that has three massive towers 
that run into Ohio, Pennsylvania, and all the way through Michigan. So that's a, a, another thing that you, that I find a correlation with is the power lines. The dump I do too. Um, what is it? A migratory route? Um, I have a theory about when people say they get zapped. Okay, it's just a theory. I've been zapped many times. That's what they call it. EMF zapped. It's not. It's electro. It's not. I mean, they call zapped or uh, infrasound. It's electromagnetic frequency poisoning. Now, you can also get that from being near power lines. Okay, but are, do they absorb this? I mean, at their size, the mineral content in their bones, we absorb things. We absorb stuff all the time. Do they absorb this? Uh, yeah, I, I subscribe to the theory of, of infrared or ultrasound. Uh, it's it's well documented that tigers do this when they're when they they uh, basically go after their prey. They'll they'll stun their prey with with ultrasound to disorient them. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's I mean it's actually documented. Uh, yeah, I was and, yeah, but then there's the things. Look at all the reports of equipment with full charges dying. Look at all the reports of cameras with corrupt files when people take video or stuff. Game camera reports that have 50 pictures on it and it's all file corrupt, file corrupt, file corrupt. The only thing that can do that is an electromagnetic frequency pulse or force that can wipe out memory cards that can destroy equipment that can drain the batteries i i mean this is this is true this happens this happened to us where we had fully charged batteries and we're out there and all of a sudden the battery's just dead and there's no files in the camera this happened multiple occasions okay uh this is something that should be considered well i you know the thing is that this is this is how i equate it you don't have to subscribe to my theory, but this is how I equate it. If it's mechanical, it'll fail. And it fails when you least want it to. That's called Murphy's Law. Uh, okay, I Murphy's kinda, Law, that doesn't fail with the deer pictures. There's millions in every day. But all of a sudden, it's just Murphy's Law. This camera fails. I've on deer pictures. I've had them fail on elk pictures. Uh, where I got like a half picture, and then the rest of the SD cards just wiped. So it's, I mean, it's, it happens. I, you know, now when I'm, I'm doing research on these things, would I rather have a, a strictly mechanical camera to take my pictures? Absolutely, with old-fashioned film. It's a little harder for it to fail. And, you know, but with you know the way digital works nowadays I, i've even been out on you know calls where i thought i had everything on camera and it's being recorded i didn't get a damn thing i almost killed a guy last friday night that grabbed an axe when i told him to stand up and when i went back to review the video it was so cotton thick and dark you couldn't see anything you could hear everything but you couldn't see it there was, I mean, it just didn't record. So, you know. Has anybody uh, in here ever been EMF'd, like falling down in the woods, like totally sober, confused, didn't know where they were, and just falling down with a witness with them? And the witness helped them out of the woods, and then all of a sudden, the further they get away from where they are, they all of a sudden start feeling better. Has anybody that, here that, ever experienced that? I've not experienced that, but it, you know, it's. I think that's ultrasound. A lot of people get blasted with ultrasound. You don't hear it, but you damn sure feel it, and it will disrupt your internal organs. And so will EMF. Yeah, that's why you, I kind of lean towards that. Well, infrasound is actually you. It can be heard. It is audible. It can be recorded. Infrasound can be recorded audibly. Just because you're, just because of our hearing range, not hearing it, it can be recorded audibly. That's that is the truth. 
in my experience, EMF does usually knock people down. It just causes them to hallucinate, get headaches, nausea, stuff like that. Okay. Hallucinate, nausea, dizziness. Wouldn't that cause you to fall down? I've, I've done this a long time. I've had this happen to me many, many times. I've been with other people that had it happen to them. I've had it happen to my dog out there, my Great Dane. I, I've done this a long time. I've experienced this. Can I say Bigfoot did it? No. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there's something out there causing it. I've never had a stroke, never had a seizure. I've had people with me. I've been with people falling down in the woods, not knowing, thinking they're having a heart attack, not knowing what's going on. I haven't even told you of any of my encounters yet. I, not, none of my sighting encounters yet. I haven't even got there. I only told you, didn't even tell you about Ohio. That would be the second time. And then Michigan, that would be the third and fourth time. And fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth. I mean, I have no reason to make up what I'm saying. I'm just saying what I believe. Nobody can prove me wrong, just like I can't prove a woo person wrong that says these things jump through portal. And I don't believe they jump in portals and out. I do not believe that at all. But can I prove it? Absolutely not. I, you know, I've got, I've got friends outside my life. I'm not in this just to make friends. I'm in this because I want answers. I'm not in this to make money. I've made not one dime in all the time I do it. It costs me thousands of dollars a year to do what I do and to set up outings and things and to pay for everything. You know, it's, it's just not a big party, even though we enjoy our time out there. Yeah. It isn't 24 seven in the field. You got to relax. You got to stimulate your brain with other things. You've got to, you know, so I oh, spent sir, weeks in the woods. Did we hear some of your Michigan sightings that uh, uh, that you've had? So you want to skip Ohio because that would have been the next no, you know, encounter. We can start with Ohio. Okay, the second time. One or the other. At, <laughs> the very first time I went out looking for Bigfoot was maybe 2013, 2012. I, I don't know. It was a long time ago. So it was like 10 years ago, maybe more. I, 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 uh, hooked up with a guy through a site in Ohio in Portage County, Ohio, which has the leading number of sites, that whole area. It's just, it's a hot spot. And he was in the area working out of town, living in a camper out there at his boss's property. And he invited me down. I went down for f five days and four nights. Or was it opposite of that? I don't know. Four days, five nights, five. And the first night we get there, it's the first time meeting him in person. I talked to him online. Uh, we go to go in the woods. And what he wanted to do, and he's a survivalist, an outdoorsman, knows everything you can eat in the woods. His name's Richard Tree Master Moore. Okay. He knows, he knows all the flora and fauna in his area, what you can eat, what you can't. And we go out there and we hike like a mile from the property where the camper was, maybe less. And he, we start, he starts building a survival shelter and he's like, this is where we're going to sleep. I'm like, okay, so I'm helping him. We're chopping down saplings, live saplings, and leaning them on this tree that had fallen perfectly to provide a shelter for us. And he's doing all that. And I find this pile of rocks because there's areas that have a lot of rocks in Ohio that have been developed from the glaciers that left them there. I find all these rocks. I just start clanking them as hard as I can just for the heck of it. This is my first time out. I've watched Finding Bigfoot. I'm going by, you know, knocks and rocks. My first time actually trying to find Bigfoot. And I'm pounding, pounding, and then I go back and I'm helping them. And then a big, huge storm rolls in. And we knew it was time to get out. We weren't going to sleep in the shelter. We weren't even going to finish it that night. So we start hiking back to the property where the camper motorhome was. It was actually a motorhome. We start hiking back there and I keep telling them, I said, dude, there's something following us. I can sense it. I can feel it. We're being washed. I can hear it. And I'm walking slower than him because I could hear it. So I'm walking slower so I could pick up the cell phone. Dude, something is following us. Yeah, whatever. You're just, 
doll in your head. We get out, we get out off this little like game trail out onto the property and we walk up to the camper and storms coming in and I come out and I shine my flashlight to where we came out. And there were these, almost all the eyes I've ever seen, I'll tell you this, they almost glow gold yellow, like a yellow to gold. These were more amberish, less gold, uh, more reddish. And they're like huge and they're up high and they're spread wide apart. And I yell, Richard, I told you we were being followed. And he comes out and when he comes running out of the camper, it, it just like dis- disappeared. I'm sure it just turned and walked off. And I'm telling me, he's telling me, oh, no, no, you're making you're just seeing things all in your head and it's like, yeah, whatever. And he's, you know, he wasn't even a Bigfoot researcher. He was just interested. He was an outdoor enthusiast. We go to bed. It rains all freaking night. He goes to work the next morning. It rains all morning. So we're not back out to where we're supposed to be because of the severe rain and storms. And then it quits like early afternoon. He gets out of work early. So, and I said, okay, I was trying to show him an app on my phone, Toolbox. If you don't, you don't know what it is, I know it works on Android. Toolbox has a GPS to where you can record where you walk out in the middle of the woods and you can get right back there. It's an app called Toolbox. So I walked out there to show him my track. And I walked down. It's the first time I walked down there since we left there. And I walk and stand under that tree and I'm like, trees like 10 11 foot up in the air and this thing was almost up to this branch and then i walked away to so the toolbox app could track me so i'd come back and show richard and then when i walk right back past that tree and couldn't i didn't see anything okay there's no wind or nothing the storm is done you hear crack this is a gigantic tree okay crack 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 and then it comes falling down right at me Okay, and Richard hears it when he's in the camper and comes out. He's like, what's going on? I'm like, dude, something must have just pushed that over at me. So after that, I show him the app and all that, how it tracked me. And I'm I'm shooken up about this. We go back out there, finish the survival shelter. We stay there. We stay there two nights in it. And not much happens other than when we leave and we come back and there's like destroyed trees and things messed up on the final night, which would have been the fourth night. We were falling asleep while he fell asleep and I sitting up and I'm listening to music on my, my tablet and I will start hooting. There's hooting like crazy from back and forth from one side to the other so i started hooting back i do it anyways even if it is owls if i'm out there in the middle of the night i sit there and i'll, I'll hoot with them i'll communicate with them and for their interaction and so i'm doing it back and forth for 15 20 minutes and then they just stop i sit up for a little while longer i go lay down to go to bed the minute i almost fall asleep the most horrific scream that you could actually feel in your chest I wasn't even quite fully asleep when it happened. And it went on for several seconds, screamed. I punched him and he woke up and he heard half, half of it. First thing he does is, oh my God, the fire's out. What I'm doing is I'm reaching for my gun. I had a 40 caliber, caliber handgun with me. I reach for it. The minute I reach for the gun, all of a sudden I feel this like my body just, I'm conscious. I'm not in pain, but I feel this like pulsating going through my whole body. I cannot move at all. He's out starting to build the fire and he starts saying all of a sudden I could, I could hear everything. I hear this like rock hit right by him. It's like, what was that? And then another rock hits by him and he's like, Oh my God, do you smell that? Then all of a sudden I started, I was never unconscious or nothing. I was just like, like paralyzed. Then all of a sudden I started getting the tingling started going away. I could sit up and I, I can't, I saw it the night. The night of the storm, I saw something with the glowing eyes, large up. We never saw it, actually, physically, but something happened to both of us that night. Okay? That's the, my first, what I would call, for sure, encounter, because I saw it on the, the first night. I saw something, and the tree pushed over at me, and the scream, 
and the rocks and the smell and the trees being broken in the area. Like when we leave to go get dinner and come back, we come back and there'd be broken trees. So what, what was that? Was that a human out there doing that? I don't, I doubt it. Okay. That's, that's number one. Number two was in Michigan. You want me to keep going? Number, I got a, not, I got not, a quick uh, story to tell you. Okay. Uh, you asked about uh, infrasound or, you know, whatever you want to call it. I've experienced that one time. And uh, I uh, went to this area, had some friends come out because we had found this one particular part uh, had wood structures in there and uh, they wanted to see the wood structures. So I took them out there, just the three of us and uh, walking down a trail. I'd been on this trail hundreds of times, uh, never really saw anything or felt anything really weird. Uh, Walking down this trail and showing them these structures and all of a sudden, as we're walking down this trail, uh, I hear this real low growl. Um, very, you can you can barely hear, it, but you can hear. It. And I stopped in my tracks and I turned around and looked at them and I said, "Hey, did y'all hear that growl?" And they said, "Yeah, we heard it." And I turned back around on this trail that I had been down hundreds of times, and. Uh, I didn't know where I was. I didn't know how to get back to our camp. Um, It was the strangest feeling I'd ever felt because, you know, I, I, I knew these, these trails like the back of my hand and I didn't know where I was, didn't know how to get back to camp. And we, we actually had to shoot GPS up to get back to our camp. And uh, so I know that infrasound or whatever you want to call it, I know that exists because it's happened to me. And uh, it's it's a pretty scary thought when you are familiar with an area and and you know your way around. And all of a sudden, uh, in a split second, uh, you don't know where you're at. You don't know how to get back to where you were. And you don't know what trail that you're supposed to go down to uh, just to get back to camp. So I've experienced that. And it's it's a pretty frightening experience. Hey, everyone. We're just about out of time. Mike, Chad, thank you for the information. Mike, can you give us your contact information so witnesses in your region can contact you if they see something? Yeah, absolutely. So they can get a hold of me on Facebook at Michael Burkhart, or Michael D. Burkhart on Facebook. And I also put, if you guys want to check out every piece of evidence we ever found, uh, Cecil County, Sasquatch, Maryland group on Facebook, you can uh, ask for an invite and uh, me and my admins will put you in the group. It's a private group. We probably have about 320 members. But, you know, it's just a place where, you know, you got to put your stuff somewhere. And it's better to be in a private group than, you know, public group, so... If anybody wants to get a hold of me about any of these sightings, I'm open. All righty. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening, and join us next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then...